We're going to look today at the GI movement internally, the GI movement and its impact on the broader um, uh, public opinion and the civilian anti-war movement. We're going to look at uh, what happened to some people who were inside and spoke up, stood up, and uh, were uh, canned because of that, um, and have continued to, to bring home uh, to today even, what the legacies that war that we all have a responsibility, uh, the government certainly as well, to help address and clean up. Um, so first we'll start with Dave Courtright. Uh, many of us know Dave, of course. Um, he was an active duty um, enlistee uh, from 68 to 70. Uh, wrote the book Soldiers in the Revolt, the seminal book on the GI movement inside. Uh, he was, he's currently the director of, uh, pol of, of uh, professor and director of policy studies at Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. And I got to know Dave very well when he was a director of SANE, um, Peace Action, uh, in Washington, D.C. in the uh, mid-70s and did an outstanding job with that. Um, and, Jerry will, uh, and Dave will be followed by Jerry Lemke, um, correct? And Jerry is, um, uh, he was a drafted uh, Vietnam veteran. He was assigned when he got enrolled as, to an artillery unit in Vietnam as a chaplain's assistant. Oh my gosh. Um, he's the author, among other books, of uh, the, splitting, the Spitting Image, Myth, Memory, and the Legacy of Vietnam. And he'll talk about uh, the Vietnam veterans' role um, in, in the, uh, internally within the military and also in the broader peace movement as well. And my friend Frank Joyce, um, who's, as they say, it's all on the website, a Detroit-based activist who's uh, also a writer, uh, an organizer, been involved in organizing so many of the national demonstrations and initiatives we had over the years. He's on, the, among others, the Chicago Way trial staff um, and the author of the book most recently called The People Make the Peace. And Frank is going to provide a little bit of a broader overview of, uh, civilian anti -war, of the civilian anti-war movement in the post-67 period. And uh, Susan Schnell, was, we heard her last night, very powerful. Um, she was a, a, milita a Navy nurse in 69, 67 to 69. She got court-martialed for airdropping uh, anti-war leaflets uh, over an air base, in, I mean, a military base in, in the West Coast. And because of that, was court-martialed and has been working hard to um, continue to make sure that people understand that we still have a legacy to, to work on and clean up. Uh, in Indochina. Uh, and finally, Susan Hammond has an audiovisual presentation. Susan um, herself uh, was the daughter of a Vietnam veteran, is a daughter of a Vietnam veteran. Um, and uh, she's been living and working in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia since not 2006 or 5. 19, I'm sorry, 1995, excuse me, uh, for 21 years, 22 years. Uh, and she founded the War Legacy. Um, uh, project uh, to provide services to families uh, who were impacted by Agent Orange and other um, results of U.S. military intervention that are still killing people today. So, David, we'll start out with you, and I'll be a hard ass and try to keep us all on schedule. So, thank you. Let's give it up for Dave Courtright. All right. Thank you, Brewster, and thanks everyone for being here. I want to reiterate the thanks that have been expressed many times to Terry and John and Ann Gallivan, who did most of the work to help put this together. I came late to the anti-war movement, like many soldiers and veterans. Uh, in 1967, I was still an undergraduate at Notre Dame and trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. Uh, Uncle Sam had a plan for me. I didn't know it. And as soon as I graduated, I got my report for the, the military physical for the draft. Uh, so I panicked and uh, signed up for an extra year. I was a, da a draft-induced volunteer, as they called us in those days. Uh, and I was in the Army Band. Yes, I defended our country by playing the trumpet and trombone. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Bill, uh, Bob Levering said that many of us who were part of the military regretted having been part of that war. And that was certainly the experience that I had and many others. And for me, it was a crisis of conscience, someone later told me, that I experienced. Uh, as I realized what was really going on and was angry at myself that I had allowed myself to be caught up in this uh, horrendous war. But you know, we were mostly working class soldiers and vets. Uh, Christian Appy's important book, The Working Class War, 80% of those of us who served were working class, which meant we didn't have families that could contact lawyers and doctors and get easy exemptions. When the draft came along, we had no other option, and we got sucked up into the military. But as I began to see the truth and recognize how horrible this war was, I had to speak out. And so I became part of the GI movement. And I wrote my book about that. And so I want to just briefly describe a bit 
uh, the scale of that movement and talk about the dissent and then also the resistance of the movement. And maybe a good way to start is to quote from that article that many of you know about that appeared in the Armed Forces Journal. No pacifist drag that. Uh, and the opening, the title of it was The Collapse of the Armed Forces. The first line says, the morale, discipline, and valor worthiness, worthiness of the US Armed Forces are, with a few salient exceptions, lower and worse than at any time in this century and perhaps in the history of the United States. <laughs> yeah, and I was part of that and doing everything I can to accentuate that process. Uh, the GI movement was uh, spread throughout all of the armed forces in every major military base on many ships, uh, in bases in Germany and Korea. There were anti-war committees that it formed, such as the ones that I was active with at Fort Hamilton in New York and at Fort Bliss in Texas. In Texas, we had GIs for Peace. We had our underground newspaper called The Gig Line. We had a coffee house downstairs in a downtown area of El Paso. And there were more than 300 anti-war GI newspapers published in those days. There's a new online resource called the GI Press Project that James Lewis has put together. And James has found evidence of as many as 400 anti-war newspapers published by GIs for GIs that circulated in the military in those days. And more than 30 coffee houses were active across the country. And we organized demonstrations and protests and petitions. Uh, the one action I remember vividly was the petition that appeared uh, the Sunday before the moratorium rally in Washington in November 1969. How many of you were part of that rally? Probably a lot of you. And maybe you remember the Sunday before, on the back page of the Week in Review, full page, we are GIs opposed to the war in Vietnam. 1,365 of us signed that petition and had our names published in the New York Times. We were very proud to be part of that. And then on that following Saturday, many of us came down. As those of you who were there know, there, there were hundreds of uh, GIs and veterans who, who led that march. And that was just one example of the many protests that occurred throughout the military. But the GI resistance was much more than that. Those of us who had some college education, we expressed our opposition through words. But there were a lot of our brothers and sisters who resisted through action. And so there was a breakdown, a fundamental breakdown in the functioning of the military through those years. A number of expressions of it I can share. Uh, one was the increase to record levels of AWOL and desertion within the armed forces. 1971 was the peak, and that year in the Army, there were 17% of all the troops in the Army were either AWOL or deserted during that year. Deserted means you're gone for more than 30 days. Highest rates in the history of the military. Uh, another example of that is the widespread rebellion that was uh, led by the African-American troops. Uh, someone mentioned earlier Wallace Terry's famous book, The Bloods, talking about the experience of African-American troops. Uh, and throughout the military, there were many uprisings at Travis Air Force Base, at Long Bin Jail, we called it LBJ, mockingly referring to Lyndon Johnson. One of the biggest jails in Vietnam, there was a major uprising in 1968. Uh, the troops actually held parts of that uh, jail for almost a month, uh, and a, a really terrible and quite violent uprising. And there were many others across the military, including on one of the major uh, aircraft carriers, the USS Kitty Hawk, 1972. While it's on battle station in the Gulf of Tonkin, a major uprising aboard ship that put the ship out of commission for a short while. <clears throat> the effect of the GI resistance was most powerfully expressed in Vietnam where there was what I called a quasi-mutiny, which was expressed in many ways. One was the spread of combat refusal. That's the military euphemism for mutiny. Uh, and when I did my book, I found uh, 10 examples. Since then, there's been many more uh, searches and research efforts into this phenomenon. And one scholar found that in the first cavalry division alone, in 1970, that was one of seven or eight divisions that were in Vietnam at that time, there were 35 recorded instances of combat refusal. So you think about that, it meant that there must have been hundreds of incidents of soldiers refusing to fight. 
And indeed, there were stories even in the US uh, News and World Report and the Daily News, uh, Life Magazine, full page stories, even in uh, television stories of soldiers refusing to fight. Uh, the term that was used was working it out. The troops would be sent out, they'd get out past the line, they start talking to the lieutenant or captain and say, we're not going anywhere. Uh, they'd go someplace where they could camp out for a couple of days. That would be their combat mission. Uh, this was increasingly common as the war went on. There was also a war within the army of the enlisted men against the senior sergeants and the officers. This was fragging, uh, killing attacks against officers and senior uh, enlisted commanders or, or NCOs uh, through fragmentation grenades. Uh, and I looked in my research and found uh, Army's own evidence that there were hundreds of incidents of fragging and approximately 80 or 90 uh, officers and senior uh, sergeants were killed by their own men uh, through these fragging incidents. But for every one of these uh, violent attacks, there were many more symbolic attacks. And there was actually a protocol of fragging. Uh, if there was a zealous officer who was harassing the African American troops, cracking down on the guys who were smoking weed, uh, trying to get medals by pushing the troops out on combat patrols, uh, first was just the fragmentation grenade would just go on their bunk. You know, it's a warning. Uh, if that didn't work, then came a smoke grenade. Uh, and then if that didn't work, then there was often the violent attack. And as I've talked to soldiers and veterans over the years since I wrote the book, uh, I found more and more who would admit that, yeah, we used that. My own brother was over there, uh, and he was in a, a communication specialist, but they had an officer who was harassing them all for smoking weed, so they put the frag on his bunk. After that, no, no one was bothering him anymore. So it's uh, an example of the kind of uh, intensive resistance inside the military, uh, especially in Vietnam. The movement began and the resistance began in the Army and the Marine Corps, where the war was obviously concentrated, the ground war. But as the troops were pulled out, uh, as we know, the air war intensified, and the burden of battle shifted to the Navy and the Air Force. And then with that, also, the GI movement shifted. So if you look at the pattern of the soldier anti-war newspapers, uh, most of them were in the Army and the Marine Corps in 68, 69. By 70 and 71, there's a big increase in the number of anti-war newspapers aboard the major aircraft carriers and uh, naval bases and Air Force bases. Uh, there were several campaigns uh, to try to keep the carriers at home. You know, the Con Constellation and the Coral Sea on the West Coast, big campaigns that were a, com a partnership between the civilian anti-war movement in San Diego or the Bay Area and active duty sailors on those ships to try to get the local community, in some cases there were uh, uh, unofficial ballot referenda campaigns to have citizens vote to keep the constellation of the Coral Sea or other ships uh, from sailing. Uh, there were also, and this is one of the least known parts about it, uh, direct acts of sabotage against many ships. Uh, in the hearings that were held in Congress, they, there was uh, word of several hundred incidents of sabotage. The two biggest and most significant were in 1972, USS Forrestal, based in Norfolk. Uh, there was a fire that destroyed the con tower and the communications of the carrier. Uh, it was an act of sabotage. A sailor was later convicted. Uh, but it put that ship out of commission for several months. And then on the west coast, the USS Ranger, uh, some sailors took a gigantic bolt and dropped it in one of the main engines, knocked it out of commission, destroyed that engine, uh, and that ship was out of commission for several months. So you could begin to see that uh, the resistance was such that the functional, the operational capacity of the military itself began to decline. And then it shifted to the Air Force as well. Uh, and there were growing numbers of examples of sabotage and also refusal to participate in the Air Force. And then as you remember, at the time of the Christmas bombing in 72, uh, there were a group of B-52 pilots who filed a lawsuit uh, with Congressman, Congresswoman Liz Holtzman to call, bring the uh, bombing campaign to a halt. So there's much more, but this is a, a kind of a quick overview. And I think it's important to understand the impact of this resistance, this movement in the military, uh, to the broader anti-war movement. Uh, clearly, it was a manifestation that so many people were opposed, including many of those inside the military. But it also puts a lie 
to the revisionist argument we hear from those who would say, well, we could have won the war, but there was a stab in the back by the liberal politicians. We should have maintained the war. We could have defeated them. The, the, the argument that we won every battle uh, in the war. But the troops who were being called upon to do that fighting, and the sailors and the airmen, uh, were increasingly saying no. And it was impossible for them to continue the war. They had to withdraw the troops. They accelerated the rate of withdrawal in 1970 and afterwards because they could see that the army on the ground in Vietnam was falling apart. And they were not able to continue the air war either. So my argument is that the US armed forces ceased to function as an effective fighting force. You know, one could argue about when that was true. Certainly by 1970, it might have been true even a little bit earlier. Uh, but after that period, it was no longer possible to think of the military as a force. And this widespread resistance within the military itself placed a significant limit on the ability of the war makers to pursue the war. Thanks. Give it up, David Corbett. That's great. Didn't have to use my one minute. That was wonderful. One minute left. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So, Jerry, I'd like you to step up, and as you're coming, just want to make sure everybody knows that Jerry, um, some of you read this already, uh, did a, an, a review, an essay uh, titled Burns and Novick, Masters of False Balancing. Anybody read that yet? Powerful, powerful. It is available, so you can see on the website where you can get it from. So, thank you very much. Jerry, take it away. Well, <clears throat> I could summarize uh, what David uh, said here in a different way. Direct the mic. The mic. Oh. I, I only heard that reminder uh, a dozen times out here this morning. <laughs> I shouldn't need it. Um, uh, David's uh, uh, point that he just made is that uh, the war was an empowering and politicizing experience uh, for thousands of GIs, Marines, sailors, and airmen. Uh, David Zeiger's film, Sir, No Sir, which I recommend, recalls that Donald Duncan, Susan Schnall, and Dr. Howard Levy all turned against the war while they were still in uniform. Levy was court-martialed for refusing to train medical personnel to go to Vietnam. Susan was court-martialed, as David told us, for dropping anti-war leaflets over the Bay Area military installations. But we also need to remember that millions of other Americans, unlike those of us here today, these are forgotten figures. Duncan, Schnall, Levy, who should be role models for a new generation of military recruits, are in fact MIA from social memory and public discourse surrounding the war in Vietnam and the conflicts that we're involved in today. And we need to understand how this happened, how and why so many Americans have forgotten so much about the in-service and veteran, re uh, veteran rejection of the war. We need to understand to begin with that GI and veteran resistance was front page news from the mid-1960s to the end of the war. The New York Times, carried full page ads, David told us, Life Magazine, Los Angeles Times, New York Daily News, all carried feature stories on GI resistance, uh, in-service resistance to the war. All this the American people knew at that time. What happened between then and now? What happened to these memories? Forgetting. We need to understand that forgetting is not just a lapse in memory, not just a failure of memory. Forgetting is not about something that did not happen, memory. We forget something because something else displaces that something. A new memory overrides or supplants and takes the place of what we had known from experience or from primary evidence. Forgetting is about something else being remembered. The memory that the anti-war movement reached out to GIs with legal services, 
and offers a sanctuary for deserters isn't just lost, as in, oh gosh, what did I do with that memory? It has rather been displaced, pushed aside by images of protester hostility to GIs and veterans. The most iconic of those displacing images is that of spitting. Anti-war activists are said to have spat on Vietnam veterans. There's no evidence that that ever happened and only a sketchy record of anyone at the time saying that it was happening. A 1971 survey by the Harris Poll conducted for the US Senate reported that 99% of Vietnam veterans saying they were welcomed home by friends and family in a friendly manner. 99%, this is a poll taken in 1971. 94% of the veterans polled saying their reception home from their age group peers was friendly. 94% from age group peers, the very people who supposedly were spitting on them. Only 1% of the veterans in that poll described their homecoming as, quote, not at all friendly in poll speak. Nevertheless, when I wrote a book in 1998 about the mythical nature of the stories, I was met with criticism, much of it which took the form of first person, I was spat on stories, or I saw it happen stories, and many more claims that my dad, my uncle, my neighbor said it happened to him. And the stories have never stopped coming. I had an op-ed piece in the New York Times just last week, and it drew uh, 200 and some uh, responses. And there, in those responses, there are several first person, I was spat on claims, Jerry Lemke doesn't know what he's talking about. And then there were, they cut, the Times cut off the comments at 200 and some comments, but the Times continued to, re, to receive letters. And uh, one of these uh, that the Times forwarded to me reads like this, this is just last week. Quote, when I landed at Travis Air Base, 29 July 1970, there were two MPs greeting me. One of them said, sir, Good thing you landed at night. Why, was my response. Because during the day, we have to wear ponchos. They line up at the fence behind us and spit on us. Quote, unquote. Right? So the stories keep coming. I think, I think there are as many of these stories now today, new, new versions of the stories. I do collect the stories, by the way. Um, I have a spreadsheet in which I enter all of the first-person stories that I come across. So if no one was spat on, then where do these stories come from? These new, inaccurate, displacing stories, these memories, where do they come from? Well, Hollywood helped. Remember Rambo saying, those maggots at the airport spitting, calling us baby killers and all kinds of vile crap? Calling us baby killers, Rambo says. Almost as popular now as the spitting stories, protesters supposedly denigrated returning veterans as baby killers. Some of the baby killer stories say that protesters hoisted placards with baby killers written on them. Scanning dozens of panoramic news photos of anti-war rallies and marches, I've never seen one of those signs. My, new, my search of the New York Times archive, again, I did it just a couple of weeks ago, I didn't find any connection of the baby killer phrase with Vietnam veterans. Before 1979, which was about the same time that the first Rambo film went into production. Like with the spitting stories, there's no reports from back in the day of that ever having happened. There's more at stake than the historical record in these stories. In the first place, there's smears on the reputation of the anti-war movement. And that legacy has consequences. Opposition to the first Persian Gulf War began almost 
immediately when troops deployed to Iraq in the fall of 1990. But the stories of spat on Vietnam veterans soon followed. And those stories became the pause button. Whoa, we don't want to do that to our soldiers today with those anti-war 60s people did to Vietnam vets. As we know now, that pause morphed into the Yellow Ribbon Campaign. And that twisted the opposition to, the opposition to war into disrespect for the troops, a discourse that stayed in play to dampen protests to the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The political implication of these stories, in other words, is more important than their veracity. The stories pair the images of bad anti-war activists spitting on Vietnam veterans, conjuring their opposite, the image of good veterans, the patriotic veterans loyal to the mission, who acted with virtue and valor under fire. It's the pairing of good and bad in this manner, typical, by the way, of classical uh, classic myth structures, that then formed the storyline that the war fought by these good war veterans was a good war, lost to betrayal on the home front. The betrayal thesis for the lost war in Vietnam is dangerous because it keeps alive the fantasy that we could win wars like it if, if we the people only stay loyal to the mission. The stories are mythical, not because they're not true. Indeed, an anti-war activist somewhere, sometime, may have spat on or called a Vietnam veteran a baby killer. I can't prove the negative, can't prove that it didn't happen. Rather, the stories are mythical because of the way they are used. Mythical because of the narratives or the storylines that they help create. The stories of the stepping off points for betraying veterans as victims of a war, making them thereby props in the notion of mutual destruction. The phrase coined by Jimmy Carter to say that the US and Vietnam suffer equally in the aftermath of the war. The distortion lent to Carter's thesis by legends of veteran debasement is that the American damage was self-inflicted the conclusion to which were led by the Burns and Novick film. Viewed as victims, the political descent of GIs and veterans was then easily cast as a kind of catharsis, a kind of therapeutic acting out. Viewing Vietnam veterans as victims is a textbook instance of psychologizing the political. Victim veterans deserve sympathy and treatment but not credence for their testimony as witnesses to war. The danger is made clear in, with a look back to the way shell-shocked veterans of World War II became political props in Germany's post-war betrayal narrative for its loss. Shell-shocked veterans theirs became stand-ins, proxies for the trauma of the nation suffering a loss of racial pride and international status. Shell shock as a wound symbolized a nation that needed to heal, a people needing to find moral validation in their hurts and seeking retribution. Right wing Republicans in the US have been running on the anger and anxiety left by the loss in Vietnam since Ronald Reagan declared the war to have been a noble cause. Republican campaign rhetoric is loaded with rewords. Restore, return, rebuild, repair, all conjuring a better America that existed in some past time. It's the imagined America of white picket fences, mushrooming Levittowns, and the Gobbler Cafe in Worthington, Minnesota that Tim O'Brien remembers for us in the Burns and Noe film. And it is the future behind us that Donald Trump's base wants to take back from those of you who marched here in 1967 and those of us who came home from Vietnam stronger and smarter than we went.
Most of the talk about the lessons of the American war in Vietnam is about what they, the war makers, should have learned, should have bombed earlier, should have targeted differently, should have invaded the North, the North, say the militarists. Seek peace settlements, say the peacemakers, and respect, respect the principles of just war. As if the White House and the Chiefs of Staff are waiting to hear from us. Less often do I hear the anti-war movement, the anti-war community, speak about the lessons it learned from its work to end the war. Did hear some of that this morning. Good for those speakers. I learned that wars and war makers do not stop themselves. Wars, active verb, are stopped. War makers, active verb, can be stopped. The war in Vietnam ended when the liberation forces in Vietnam stopped the US war machine. And the Vietnamese did that in an alliance with an international movement, at the center of which was the US anti-war movement. US soldiers and veterans who turned against the war were at the core of that domestic opposition to, to the US war, and the strength of their resistance was derived from, from class and racial consciousness and the resources of the movement itself. This lesson is obscured and obvi obvi obviated by images of veterans spat on, called baby killers, and represented as damaged goods. Anti-war movements are mounted on images of strength, not hurt and loss. Moral admonitions and reminders of the human and environmental costs of war are but road bumps, in the, road, are but road bumps for a national leadership fueled by lost war revanchism and hell-bent on making America strong again and restoring an idyllic America that never existed. We have to remember, as Robert um, Leveron said this morning, that the lessons, the lessons of history that we made, we have to remember those lessons, and we have to act on those lessons to stop new wars. Wars will not be fought, David reminds us, if nobody will fight them. That's the lesson learned. It really is that simple. We just have to remember it. Thank you. Frank Joyce, and Frank, thanks for being a wonderful MC last night. Well, thank Take you. Uh, I want to join in thanking John and Brewster and Ann and Terry and other people who've provided leadership, not for putting this, just for putting this gathering together, uh, but the preceding one in 2015, and I'll come back and say a word about that in a minute. Yesterday, uh, I had the privilege of meeting with the staff of a social justice organization that's based here uh, in Washington. And as the meeting was ending, people were asking me, you know, what else are you going to do while you're here in Washington? And my answer was, I'm going to go get together with some people and see if we can help the anti-war movement overcome its inferiority complex. And I say that very much in the spirit of what David and Jerry have said. When many of us met in 2015 here in Washington to commemorate an anniversary or several anniversaries of the anti-war movement, not that long before, there had been a com commemoration of a major achievement of the civil rights movement in Selma, Alabama. The event in Sel Selma, Alabama was attended by 80,000 people and the President of the United States. Our event was attended by about 800 people. And yet, as other speakers have pointed out, by any numerical quantitative measure, more US Americans 
were engaged and participated in the anti-war movement than in all of the other social movements of the 1960s combined. So why is it, as Jerry has helped us understand from a particular perspective, that scholars who study the movements of the 60s, for example, understudy the anti-war movement by a significant margin. When Corrine Aguilar, Sam Juan, and I were co-editing our book, The People Make the Peace, we researched the databases on scholarly studies of the movement. And the anti-war movement receives dramatically less attention. This meeting could not be more timely. And this focus on the Pentagon could not be more significant. Because the reason that that is the case, meaning no disrespect to other movements, which all of us also participated in, we are the more dangerous force. We are the threat that there came a time in US history when people were willing to go to the Pentagon to confront the seat of military power and imperialism and the arc of the history of race-based imperialist colonial capitalism was to go to the heart of the matter. I've often thought that the number one value of the United States, when I think about the founding of this nation, the number, the core value, when you drill all the way down to the heart, to the bedrock, the core value of the United States is obviously hypocrisy. <laughs> but the layer right above that the value that we could not be having this conversation in a better time than today is that the association of the concept of freedom with killing other people. We here today in the argument about Colin Kaepernick, in the argument about the soldier killed in Nigeria and how that family was treated, by Donald Trump over and over and over again, they died to make us free. Think about that. Think how often we hear that. But they didn't die to make us free. They killed to make us free. They killed the Navajo, they killed the Seminole, they killed the Iroquois. They killed slaves, they killed slaves who rebelled, they killed in the Philippines, they killed in Hawaii. They used nuclear weapons in the greatest attack on civilians in the history of the world in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we, we went to the Pentagon to challenge that mindset. There's two problems that have already been identified with the Ken Burns series. One is, as has been said, we were right. And that series, in a way, validates that fact. True. We have no regrets. And they do. The series validates that to a point. But the most important thing, and the most difficult thing, and the thing Hollywood and Ken Burns and the Bank of America and the Pentagon and a vast industry is devoted to obscuring is that we were effective. That's what they want us to forget. That's the amnesia that it is critical for them to manufacture. Okay, so what's that got to do with hap what happened between 67 and 1975? You may be wondering <laughs> the assigned topic that I'm up here to talk about. I can answer that question. <laughs> and I can't 
I don't want to answer the question by highlighting, well, we had the Indochina Peace Campaign, and we have the People's Peace Committee, and we have GI coffee houses, um, and we have this, that, and the other activity. All of those things are true, and many of us in this room participated in some of those things, very many of those things, as a matter of fact. And, in fact, Tom Wells' book is written in a chronological order, and it goes year after year after year as to what were the things that the anti-war movement did. And I also want to commend the full disclosure website, uh, and I know how he's going to talk later, I don't see him now, but there's a terrific developing chronology on the full disclosure website about the history of the anti-war movement. The larger point that I want to make to help us overcome our inferiority complex is that despite the fact, the concentration that Tom Wells gives to the infighting, to the disintegration of some of the unity that was expressed at the time of the Pentagon March that other speakers have spoken to, is that despite those conflicts, and despite how messy the anti-war movement was, and it did get messier between 1967 and 1975, any of us who ever sat in any of those eight-hour meetings can attest to that. But despite that messiness, we continued and we displayed the kind of creativity, the kind of innovation, the kind of courage, and the kind of confrontation that makes movements happen, that happened in the movement to dismantle Jim Crow that the abolitionists displayed in the movement against uh, uh, slavery uh, at an earlier time in our history. And my particular interest in participating in this event and others like it is not about nostalgia and not about weren't we great once. We did make one big mistake, by the way. I thought about this several times over the last couple days. That slogan we had about never trust anybody over 30, we did not think that through. <laughs> we did not take the long view <laughs> on that question. And I say that for the specific reason of challenging us now. I believe we're in a remarkable moment in the history, not just of the United States, but in the history of the species Homo sapiens on this planet. We have had 500 years of evolving a system of colonialism, imperialism, and race-based capitalism, and we are coming to the end of that road. There's two ways we're going to get there. It's going to deliver us to extinction, and I don't say that lightly or to be glib. I say it in the context of actual existential threats that life on this earth, not just human life, plant life, the life of rivers and the life of coral reefs, the life of animals, and the life of human beings. Somebody said a cute thing the other day about tax breaks for rich people and what good are they going to do you if a nuclear bomb goes off in New York City? We do face existential threats, but we also face opportunities to create a different kind of system using the skills, the courage, the righteousness, and the understanding of the history of what we did applied to 2017. Thanks. Wow, thanks, Frank. Powerful. Good. Thanks. Oh, you, dear, you're up. Good to have you here. Thank you very much. Give, give it up for Susan for what she's been through and what she's stood up for. Thank you. Good afternoon. Like all of you, I've been through a lot. It's not anything more. I just got a little bit more creative and was able 
to be successful without having our plane shot down over Alameda Naval Air Station. I would not try that today. Except that, by the way, Alameda has been decommissioned. So you could go over there and see where the Navy cruiser used to be. But I'd like to start off again by saying to you my kind of subject was to talk about the veteran post-war. And I'm going to start with a poem that was written by a very close friend, colleague, who started Veterans for Peace about 32 years ago. Some of you may know him. His name is Doug Rawlings. He spent a year of duty of his life in Vietnam, and he wrote this. If you're a man then, a survivor of sorts, she'll come to you across the decades, casting a shadow in the dying light of your dreams, naked and nine, terror in her eyes. Of course, you will have to ignore her if you wish to survive over the years. But then your daughters will turn nine, and then your granddaughters nine, and the shadows lengthen. So you will have no choice on that one night screaming down the ridge road, lights off, under a full moon, she standing in the middle of the road, still naked and nine, terror in her eyes. Now you must stop to pick her up, to carry her back home where she came from, to that gentle village where the forgiving and the forgiven gather at high noon. There are no shadows. The wounds of the war in Vietnam, the American war in Vietnam, are not always visible to the naked eye. It's often more than an elderly man walking down the street unsteadily, using crutches or a walker or a wheelchair. It's more than meeting an older man wearing a cap saying, I am a Vietnam veteran. Today, over 40 years after the last US troops left Vietnam, we continue to study and research the impact of that conflict on the American service men and women who were in the military from 1961 to 1975. Estimates are that 2,709,918 U.S. troops were in Vietnam. Less than 850,000 are alive today, or about one-third. There are estimates about 390 die every day. And this is at about the same rate as those who were in World War II. Between 1 to 1.6 million either fought in combat, provided close support, or were regular, regularly exposed to attack. 25% were draftees. They accounted for 30% of those killed in Southeast Asia. 65% of those killed were between the ages of 17 to 24. 76% of the men sent to Vietnam were from lower, middle, working class backgrounds. They went as children and adolescents, the males full of raging testosterone and images of the male hero, impervious to harm, pain, suffering, and death. They returned home disillusioned after witnessing armed struggle, harm, and destruction to women children, and the elderly. They returned with guilt and remorse for their actions, or full of bravado and souvenirs cut from human beings and with nightmares of the killing. As a Vietnam veteran returned home, he became part of a group of those who shared the common experience of war and combat. His trauma and that of his comrades were a shared emotional memory. His trauma became theirs. Normalization took place within the context of the peer group. These soldiers came back to a society 
that was unable as well as unwilling to share that experience of committing unspeakable acts. How do you grapple with a society that denies the reality of your pain? Get over it. It's your weakness. It's your fear. It's all imagined. Buck up and become a man. Having malformed babies, it's unrelated to serving in Vietnam. Dying at an early age to cancer, unrelated to war. Anxiety is moral weakness. Those lessons you learned in combat, detachment, vigilance, control, anger, and rage, no longer useful in the home world. In the late 1960s, New York City Vietnam veterans against the war, recognizing the confluence of medical, physical, emotional needs of the Vietnam veterans, formed rap groups, no judgment discussions, and invited Dr. Robert J. Lifton to work with them as equals. Although these veterans knew they were hurting and knew they needed help, they avoided contact with the VA, feeling that VA doctors would interpret their rage as no more than their individual problem. These veterans had bitterness, distrust, and suspicion of those in positions of authority and responsibility. They questioned whether their sacrifice was all for nothing. They had a sense of violated personal and social order related to conditions imposed on them by the war. These veterans did not consider themselves as patients, but wanted and needed to understand what they had been through to be able to begin to heal themselves. And they needed to educate the American public about the human cost of war. They were healing themselves and finding political expression. Veterans became healers to each other. Assessments, and my goodness, we have study after study after study of American veterans who were in Southeast Asia. It's been going on since the last US troops left Vietnam. So there are multiple assessments. And I'll mention to you one of the better known, the National Vietnam Veterans Readjustment Society. Started in 1983, it continued. There was one analysis in 1983, and 25 years later, there was a reanalysis of the same data. So in 1983, they showed in terms of post-traumatic stress, and I'm not going to say post-traumatic stress disorder, because disorder makes a pathology of the individual. I will say, and I know all of us will agree, war is what is abnormal. War is the disorder. It's not in the individual. So even though today we hear those words over and over again, post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress, it is the response of the individual to trauma. So these studies showed in 1983, 53% of men developed partial or full post-traumatic stress, 48% of women. There was a reanalysis of the data, and it showed that those veterans with post-traumatic stress symptoms were twice as likely to die in the 25 years between 1983 and 25 years later when there was a reanalysis of, of the data than those who did not have post-traumatic stress. And now we can relate it to individuals of the same age and say that if you were in the military in Vietnam and had post-traumatic stress, you were twice as likely to die. And this was only in 25 years. Today, it's even more. Post-traumatic stress is associated with increased mortality due to cancer, 
and what the VA calls external causes, such as drug and alcohol overdoses, accidents, and suicides. Today, we understand there is such a thing as trauma-informed care. Experience with trauma is highly correlated with serious emotional problems. Health risk behaviors, social problems, adult disease and disability, and mortality. And I would just suggest that those of us who work in the healthcare field understand that this whole identification or understanding of trauma-informed care started because the veterans came back from war and talked about it and were able to have the health profession and the VA understand trauma-informed care. And then there was and is the issue of Agent Orange dioxin's impact on humans. The biomedic study that goes back to 1969 showed that dioxin caused death, caused death and stillbirths in laboratory animals. In 1970, the Office of Science and Technology at the White House inquired about allegations of birth defects in South Vietnam resulting from military employment of defoliants, 1970. In 1978, Vietnam veterans against the war began the battle for testing, treatment, and compensation for those exposed to Agent Orange, and this was in a class action lawsuit against the chemical companies that manufactured the herbicides. 1984, there was an out-of-court settlement, so we never got to hear the information that was so vital against the chemical companies. There was a 20-year study that was commissioned by the Air Force known as Ranch Hand. Ranch Hand were the guys that used the defoliant that sprayed it from the C-123s over the countryside in South and Central Vietnam. These studies went on for about 20 years. It took many years for any information or any analysis to come out of the studies. For some of us, some of the most important information to come out was from a Dr. Richard Albanese, who designed the methodology that was to be done on the study. And he identified that there was a significant excess of birth defects in the children born to the veterans who participated in the ranch hand spraying. And for those of you who may not know, the original title of the Ranch Hand Program was Hades. The government soon changed the name. Their motto was, only you can prevent a forest. So think about destroying the food supply, destroying the environment, the mangrove forest, everything. And so for years, and I know Susan will talk about the impact on the Vietnamese population. So we know that there is that relationship between spraying and the fathers having been sprayed directly and children being born with birth defects. So let me talk now about the topic of normalization and apply it to the health process where innovations become routine. And I would suggest to you that that is the impact that the American veterans brought back to this country, to understand the impact of war on humans, to try through purposeful social action to work to heal themselves, to take responsibility and support, and to deal with the government bureaucracies. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, noted, veterans have the experience that make them the light at the top of the candle, illuminating the roots of war and the way to peace. So what are next steps? One is to continue to conduct public education on the harm and impact of Agent Orange dioxin to heal the legacies 
of the American War in Vietnam. I work with an organization called the Vietnam Association for the Victims of Agent Orange. We work together with our Vietnamese colleagues, the Vietnam Association for the Viet for Association for Victims of Agent Orange Dioxin. And our purpose is to heal the wounds of war, to bring together people who fought against each other to say now we begin that healing process. We are working together. We are working to heal those wounds of war. And I'll say again what I said last night, that we all have responsibility to take care of those people we've harmed. And we have brought extensive harm and continuing harm to the people and to the environment of Vietnam, both through the use of Agent Orange dioxin and other chemicals, as well as leaving in the land the unexploded ordnance. People continue, the farmers can't use the land and till the land because if they do, they could cause an explosion. This is over 50 years after the troops left. So in conclusion, I would like to remind all of us, and some of you may remember Dr. Stanley Milgram's warning from his very famous study. Men are doomed if they act only within alternatives handed down to them. Let us begin through our work together to follow that path to peace. Thank you. Those of you, um, I have to use my glasses, sorry. The work of many in the anti-war movement knows that um, your, wor your work didn't end on this day. You continued, many of you. There. Many Americans forget that, um, or that they are not aware, that at the end of the war, the U.S. imposed a diplomatic and a trade embargo on Vietnam. While relations were kept with Laos after the war ended, they were significantly downgraded. And of course, the U.S. had a very complicated history with Cambodia after the war, when Vietnam liberated Cambodia from the Khmer Rouge in 1979. Allies cooperated with the U.S. to isolate Vietnam into the early 1990s. The U.S. kept this war going through the embargo for 20 years, hindering efforts by American and European NGOs and the U.N. system. So unlike Japan and Europe, there was no Marshall Plan for Vietnam to help Vietnam recover from the war. The Soviet Union, Cuba, Sweden, and Finland were among the few who came to Vietnam's aid after the war on an official capacity. But this did not keep many religious groups uh, and the peace organizations away. There were many efforts as you all know in this room more than I do, um, to get aid to Vietnam after the war. I'm sure many of you are aware of this, the, uh, the friendship, um, shipment, French shipment, sorry, um, which has included a shipment of wheat, blankets, and medicine in 1978 from Houston to Saigon. Many of the organizations that were part of this, 40, at least 40 organizations that were part of this coalition continued after the war um, and after this time, to foster, uh, to promote the restoration of diplomatic relations, to conduct people-to-people -people exchanges, to organize roundtable discussions on policy issues with Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, to profess, press for humanitarian, humanitarian aid, even though they faced heavy U.S. restrictions. Can I have a show of hands of how many people were involved in the post-war reconciliation efforts? My work, for example, is a direct descendant of the Quaker AFSC project through John McAuliffe, David Elder, Lady Borton, um, also Jackie Shenyong, Roger Rump, and as well as IBS volunteers like Sally Benson, Steve Nichols, and many others who continue to be engaged in post-war Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, starting from the day the war ended. They were and continue to be my mentors who have graciously introduced me to their counterparts in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, sharing the very important relationships that they had built over the decades, first as part of the anti-war movement and then as part of the reconciliation project. Without that introduction to um, Vietnam, I would not be here today, so thank you. My colleague, Chanapa uh, Kambongsa, who could not be here today, founded a similarly named organization called the Legacies of War that focuses on addressing the bombing in Laos. And her 
She was a direct descendant of the work of Fred Brathman and John Cavanaugh at the Indochina Resource Center. When Chanapa met John in 2003 at the Institute of Poli Policy Studies, he showed her the drawings from the plane and jars that had been sitting in his closet for 40 years. And she said, I've got to, she's young, a little younger than me in her 40s, she said, I've got to do something about this problem. The Vietnam I first saw in 1991 was still extremely poor. More than 60% of the population was living on less than a dollar a day. And in Ho Chi Minh City, you could see children diving into dirty canals after scraps of vegetables thrown over the market stalls. Bombed out buildings and gun turrets, bomb craters scattered the countryside. They were evidence that the war had not been over for too many years. In the early 1990s, there were few international organizations working in Vietnam and Laos. The Mennonites and the Quakers, of course, led the way to address UXO during and immediately after the war. Slowly, other organizations began humanitarian programming in the region. First efforts were focused on post-war and reconciliation issues such as UXOs and assistance to war victims. But then the focus began to switch over to more traditional international development areas of work, education, economic development, capacity building, environmental conservation, and so on. So that today most foreign NGOs working in Vietnam, Laos, or Cambodia have no idea of the role of the early organizations in fostering post-war reconciliations and they do not want to get involved in anything that is considered politically sensitive. Finally, in 1995, the U.S. and Vietnam normalized relations, and the process of strengthening their relations um, developed politically, economically, and militarily. To now, there are military ships uh, coming to Da Nang again. I returned to Vietnam in 1996 to study, and I found a very different country than the one I, I was, that was there in 1991. And it changes every time I visit. Today, a visitor in Vietnam could easily forget that the war ever happened. The majority of the population was born after the war ended. US and Vietnam militaries are even, as I said, collaborating again on regional geopolitical and strategic issues. But war legacies still remain. Since the late, why aren't you proceeding? <laughs> Since the late 1980s, the U.S. and Vietnam have been cooperating on the recovery of U.S. MIAs in Vietnam, and they commenced full-scale operations in 1992. Searches began in Cambodia in 91 and in 1988 in Laos, and they happen two or three of these um, operations every year at a cost of more than a million each to recover our MIAs. The cooperation on this issue was one thing that led to further um, development for the Vietnamese to be able to push their own, uh, their own war legacy issues, including um, their MIAs, which of course there are 300,000 as opposed to the 1,600 that are still missing from the US. The first area of cooperation um, after normalization of relations was again on the unexploded ordnance issue in Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam. Starting in the late 1980s, my great senator from Vermont, not Bernie, though he is great, but Patrick Leahy, and his War Victims Fund began to assist those who lost limbs from the unexploded ordnance and other victims assistance programs. Later, the fund provided support in demining efforts. This you can see the red, that's all of the bombed regions of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. With advocacy efforts, oh, sorry. To date, this funding for UXO removal and victim assistance totals about 330 million since 1994. And as I said yesterday, it's about 15 million dollars a year, or the cost of one day of the bombing during the war. So much more funding is needed for certain. With the advocacy efforts of Chanaka, Liam, <laughs> sorry. Um, Titus Peachy, who many of you probably know, and others at the Legacies of War, President Obama, in his historic visit to Laos in 2016, announced a pledge of $90 million over three years for UXO removal and victim assistance in Laos. The first two installments of the $90 million pledge, totaling $60 million, were obligated in 2016 and 2017. They are being administrated by the Department of State to dozens of groups in, in Laos, mainly US-based non-governmental organizations. The Senate included 
the remaining 30 million for demining in Laos in the state and foreign ops bill this year, which Legacies of War is uh, cautiously op optimistic that the full amount will be included in the final bill. Let's hope. The legacy of the war advocacy effort is evidence that the right people working together is possible to make progress on some aspects of the ongoing impacts of the war. But unfortunately, the, the 2018 bill for Vietnam is a more modest 2.5 million allocated for, for UXO removal, and Cambodia is just over under 4.5 million. At this rate, the removal, it will take, removal will take more than 100 years to make the land safe. Areas that are heavily contaminated with UXOs are among the poorest regions of Asia, so much more needs to be done. The story of Agent Orange that <coughs> Susan mentioned and the US engagement on the issue is very long and complicated, but I'll touch upon a little bit of it. But if you are interested in the full-blown story, Charles Bailey at the Ford Foundation has a book coming out in the next um, several months on this with his colleague, uh, Lei Kei Sun in Vietnam. And he'll be here in Washington in the, over the next couple of weeks talking about the book. So check our website. I think we'll post it on there. <clears throat> Most of you are familiar. We've heard Agent Orange mentioned several times today. But I want to remind people that it wasn't just Vietnam that was sprayed, but also Laos and, and Cambodia, particularly along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And as I said last night, we really do not know if the CIA was involved in any of this spraying, because that is still classified information. Mm -hmm. Agent Orange was a 50-50 combination of 245D and two, uh, 24D and 245T, of which the, we know that now that the 245T component was contaminated with dioxin, something that the <coughs> chemical companies kept hidden um, from the U.S. government while they continued to produce um, vast, uh, you know, up to two, 20 million um, gallons of these herbicides that were contaminated. The vast environmental destruction during the war that motive uh, that you see here and this is actually in 1993 so 20 years after it motivated American scientists to advocate for the end of the Ranchan project as many of you probably know in 1970 um, there was a delegation of from the American AAS I forget what that stands for um, American uh, scientists who went to Vietnam and when they saw the environment there, they, term, uh, they coined the term ecocide to describe it. Production of the herbicides by the chemical companies that just kept pushing this out, this chemical out at, at high rates of speed, which with, the, with dioxin was created when um, they heat the chemical up too high because they were producing so much of it so fast for the US military that dioxin became a contaminant. Um, and research that was done later found that it was about 366 kilograms of di dioxin were was sprayed over Southeast Asia. And this is a huge amount considering you usually talk about dioxin as a part per trillion. You don't mention it as kilograms. Today, as um, Susan said, we know a lot more about dioxin. This is the list that the VA, um, well actually the Institute of Medicine has through their research over the last, uh, looking at research over the last 20 years, uh, 30 years now I think, I found these conditions associated with um, dioxin exposure. And the US VA now compensates veterans for about 15 of these, these conditions, including the Parkinson's disease that my father suffered from. However, when it comes to birth defects, it's a completely different story, as Susan already mentioned. While research shows dioxin can cause birth defects in animal studies, it's much harder to prove this in humans. You can't purposely expose a human to dioxin. <clears throat> It's not ethical, for, for one thing. Um, so you have to look at epidemiological studies. And when you're looking at birth defects, you often see very, very rare conditions. So you have to have a very large population for these birth defects to pop up as being as abnormal. But in all the studies in animals, in all the different species, um, reproduction, reproductive deformities is evidence. And we are very close to humans, so uh, to animals. So maybe often we're more animals than human. I think, but. It's not a big leap of logic to say you're going to see the same in, in the human species. 
interesting uh, that the, the USDA also acknowledges um, these, this list of birth defects in female veterans that they can receive compensation for. And I bring this slide up because I see just about every single one of these conditions in the children I work with in Cambodia, uh, Vietnam and Laos. Though the VA says that's for, um, no, Liam's not going, say it's for service in Vietnam, not particularly Asian Orange Dioxin. The Vietnamese have done their own epidemiological studies and found high rates of birth defects, miscarriages, and reproductive abnormalities among those who lived or fought in the sprayed regions. The Vietnam Association for Victims of Agent Orange that Susan mentioned estimate that up to 3 million Vietnamese have been impacted, including about 300,000 children born with disabilities. And we still don't know the extent of those people in Cambodia and Laos who have. Um, they just don't have the same records um, an organization behind them to, to look at this issue there. <clears throat> this has been a point of disagreement between the U.S. and Vietnamese government for decades, from the time during the war when the South Vietnamese newspapers reported women giving birth or, mis uh, or miscarrying children with severe abnormalities. And even though the U.S. veterans com compensates its, the U.S. government compensates its own veterans for some illnesses. It refuses to acknowledge that there are any impacts of Agent Orange in Vietnam, and that is um, hypocrisy that's hard for me to accept. It's important to remember that the, v the U.S. soldiers mostly were there for one year. Some did a few tours, but the Vietnamese were under the spray for 10 years, and this, these herbicides and the dioxin stayed in the soil for some period after that. It was continuing to con contaminate the food chain. Plus, young children, women, it was a completely different um, exposure. So you can't necessarily compare exposures from veterans to those in Vietnam. Dioxin remains in the soil for up to, well, we don't even know. It's um, depending on where it is. It could be hundreds and hundreds of years. And it enters the food chain by animals eating that contaminated soil. And then it enters the food chain. <clears throat> but thankfully, um, research that was done by Hatfield in Canada, when they looked at the sprayed regions of Vietnam, they found that the areas sprayed were no longer contaminated. It had moved elsewhere. The problem is these military bases, Da Nang, Vinh Hoa, Phu Cat, which have heavy, heavy levels of dioxin still in their soil. This is a, just a, a memo to, to bring me back to that day that some of you were in this room were there as well. When we went, I went to Hanoi with a delegation in 2005, and we met with the U.S. Embassy. And the, this is a memo that came out that says that the um, Agent Orange is just a propaganda on the, on the Vietnamese government in order to get reparations for the Vietnamese um, and this is from 19, this is from the early 2000s. And I remember that meeting um, where we were sitting at the embassy in Hanoi where the, the public affairs officers told our group, I wish people would stop raising the Agent Orange issue. He said, they should remember all the good that the American government did for Vietnam. I was like, huh, what? And they, they, what they did is they built the highways, they built, high, they built the airports. That there's, you know, we've done some really good things for this country. And I, I, that just pushed me to, to continue. All right, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to... Oh, Neon, you're going to have to hit that again, sorry. Go beyond, there we go. That's the Da Nang base, and when I was there, you could still smell it. Um, finally made progress in, in, uh, when uh, Bush went to Vietnam in 2006. This issue finally was on the agenda with the U.S. and Vietnam. They began to work to clean up that Da Nang Air Base. And over the years, with uh, constant advocacy work, but thankfully also the great work of my state senator, uh, my Senator Leahy, the U.S. has allocated $201 million so far um, for a cleanup and for human health aspects. Most of it is going for the cleanup of the contaminated bases. The Da Nang Base is now clean, more or less. They haven't still admitted that there are any Agent Orange victims in, in Vietnam. Though, again, with our advocacy work, we've been able to put, push them to at least target the funding to the areas that were heavily sprayed and air, uh, the most severe people. 
Um, the Vietnamese actually have done a lot more on this issue than we have. Um, the government now provides some support to people who've been affected by Agent Orange. Um, there's a government program involved, but also um, the Vietnam Association of, of Liam, Liam got it wrong again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the Vietnam Association, the Vietnam Association of Victims of Agent Orange has raised over 51 million dollars domestically to provide support to Agent Orange victims. And they are the poorest of the poor in the country. They're often raised by single mothers who the fathers are, are, may have already left, may have already died. I've been able to do work on this issue in Vietnam um, for several years. And a lot of it is funded by the family of this man. This is Bob Feldman, who in 2006, I, got, I was still working for John McAuliffe, and I got this call from a, one of those great calls when he worked for an NGO, when they said, we want to help people in Vietnam affected by Agent Orange. Turns out her husband, um, that was from Nancy Feldman, her husband was dying of lymphoma, and he wanted his VA benefits to go, because at the time the US was not providing any funding, he wanted the VA benefits to go to somebody in Vietnam also suffering. And so they set up the Bob Feldman Fund. Little did I know that it was $50,000 that was coming for this work. Um, at that time when he died, which is unusual. Um, so what we do with that funding uh, is provide support to the families. Um, a lot of them are rural farming families, so it's cows, pigs, livestock. It might be setting up a small business. It might be repairing their house, providing them with a wheelchair. It might be medical care. Oh, let's skip over that. that um, that's a video, so I won't show it, but that boy, um, when they got the chair, he and his brother are both severely disabled, and he got, they couldn't maneuver a, a you know, a self-propelled wheelchair, so we gave them electric wheelchairs, and they said, for the first time in our lives, they're both thir thir in their 30s, first time in our lives, we are free. We can go where we want on our own. It's pretty moving. I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of time. But I just wanted to point that out that one individual can do something. You don't have to feel hopeless or helpless. But you can, working together and getting the resources to the right people, you can provide help. Even though it seems like there's not much that can be done, and in some cases for these families it is too late um, for medical rehabilitation. But they, and one of the things each family always tells me is, they're so touched that someone from America has reached out across the country to help them. And that's what keeps me going. Thank you. Well, Susan and Susan and uh, Jerry, Frank, and of course, Dave, uh, thank you all very much for your articulate presentations. It was powerful and informative. So you guys are welcome to leave the stage. <laughs> now that you do such a great job. And uh, I want to introduce and bring back uh, Terry Province for some additional announcements. We'll move right along. I think we're actually on schedule, buddy. All right? Thank you very much, folks.